Anna Gabala. Welcome to the Buddy Ruski Show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation uh, with you today. It's uh, been really fun to, to do this show. I've interviewed a lot of different people, but uh, I haven't actually interviewed a ton of folks from Durham, sort of from my childhood, from my origin story. So it's nice to get to talk shop with someone who will understand a lot of things maybe that I reference about yeah, Old Durham. Yeah, of course. This is very exciting. So, How, uh, how has it been? You, you've moved back to Durham relatively recently. Uh, it's certainly much different than it was when uh, we were in high school. What has that transition been like? What, has there been anything particularly jarring that you've noticed since you've been here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, like, to me, the thing that was most surprising, um, which I think is probably similar for a lot of folks, is trying to buy a house um, in this area. Um, even, like, from when I moved back in 2015, it just seems like it's changed uh, drastically. <laughs> and that, uh, that, like, just the housing market... Uh, was quite a shock to me. Um, but I would say also, uh, like, as much as Durham is developing, like, very quickly and that, like, there have been a lot of changes just um, with, like, new businesses and everything developing that, um, I don't know, like, to me, at the heart of it, it seems that, like, Durham is still very much the same and, like, the atmosphere, if that makes sense. Like, it's still very welcoming, like, super diverse, um, just, like, a fun place to be. And that's been a pleasant surprise that, like, while a lot of it, the landscape is changing, it seems it's still got a lot of its original character, which has been really fun. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's right. And I hope that that continues. I think a lot of people are moving here for those values for and sure. things that Durham offers. So um, it's nice to be able to, to share that with folks. Um, for, for people that don't know, uh, Anna has a brand new business in downtown Durham, a moon belly company. It's a, is it a butchery? Is it, is it fair to call it a, a butchery? Yeah, you know, I guess that's what would be the best way to describe it. How would you um, describe moon belly company? So I, it's moon belly meat company is like, um, a sausage and charcuterie company. So at the moment, I'm only doing pork butchery, which is why I'm kind of hesitant to go straight into calling it a butchery. Um, but I'm doing all of the processing and butchering on my own and making um, sausage and different charcuterie projects by hand. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the bulk of it. Um, the main focus is really trying to utilize sustainable farming and as as ethical as possible farming. So the company that I've been purchasing through is called First Hand Foods, and they're actually based out of Durham as well. It's, um, I think two moms are the founders, and their, um, their goal was to try to find a way to connect like local humane farmers to retailers and restaurants because um, they found that that was like a really important value like within their own homes was just trying to supply um, meat for their families and they were finding a disconnect with like, wow, there's all these farms within North Carolina, but like how do we get the food to the table? And so um, that's my understanding at least with how they started First Hand Foods. Um, and yeah, I've been purchasing through them for like supplying all of the pork that I use and it's been a really awesome experience so far. They're like really on top of things and very professional. So yeah, it's been great. That's <laughs> super cool. I, I think you're right that uh, there's clearly a um, desire for more conscious, forward business practices in this area, um, not just on the consumer side, but also on the uh, retailer side as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think being able to provide that network to make that process seamless um, is something that I imagine businesses would be uh, interested in um, attaching themselves to. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I definitely want to hear more about the um, the sausage and charcuterie mm -hmm. business <laughs> um, that you've got going on. Um, but really, I'd like to start where I start with a lot of folks uh, at the beginning and hear a little bit sure. more about uh, what it was like for you growing up in Durham, uh, how you got into food, um, and and what that journey has been like. Sure. Um, so I, it's funny, I like 
especially I think because of the way that Durham is growing and that there are so many people that move here from out of town and fall in love and like, you know, call this their home now that um, I like, I wish so badly that I could say like born and raised in Durham because it's almost essentially that. I am adopted um, from South Korea. So uh, I was adopted very young though. I was only three and a half months old when my parents uh, brought me to Durham. <laughs> and that's where I spent like the majority of my life. I mean, you know, we went to high school together. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just funny because I feel like, especially for people who are like really from here, there's a certain amount of pride that goes along with like, I'm from Durham. Like there's just a little bit of grit to it that um, it's funny seeing the way that things have played out now with the city. Um, How would you describe that that grit? And because I, I agree, I think anyone that's from Durham, uh, even before this new renaissance that mm -hmm. happened downtown, people were very prideful of being from Durham. And I know some of it has to do with being in the triangle alongside Chapel Hill and Raleigh, which... Uh, particularly when we were growing up, were seen as you know, more affluent cities. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's a big part of it is that like I can remember even like in middle school or especially in high school, like traveling for sports or things like that, where you meet people from either Raleigh or Chapel Hill. And it's always like, oh, you're from Durham. And it's like, yeah, I am. And like, I'm proud of that. And I think there's just something kind of fun. Like I'm still very close with um, a group of girls that we all went to high school together. And like as we've moved through life and like moved to other cities and different states, that's just still always been been like a thing just a, a point of contention <laughs> where it's like no like this is a thing that we're proud of and like we're going to continue to rep Durham as hard as possible like uh even like living out west in different places I feel like I always was keeping an eye on Durham just through like social media and the news and things like that and seeing how it was growing it was like I was enjoying where I was at in these different cities, but also like low key, like, shoot, do I need to move back like right now? Like it looks like cool stuff is happening and it's like continuing to grow and like just always a little bit jealous. Like I wish I was there, but like I'm happy here too. So yeah, I, I wanted to ask younger folks who are growing up in Durham now what they think about the city. And because when we were coming out of high school, the idea of staying in Durham was almost a non-starter. You know, there was no... There wasn't a ton of opportunity here uh, in terms of like business prospects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could, if you were working in particular industries, maybe you could get a job out in Research Triangle Park or something or, or work for Duke. Um, but for the most part, once we graduated, people were like, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to college. I'm like moving away, um, you know, spread my wings. And, and so some of that has changed, I'm sure, now that there are more businesses calling this area home or at least building satellite offices here. But was that sort of the calculus for you as well? Like once you graduated, you were like, hey, I got, it's as much as I love Durham, it's time to do something different. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I went to um, Johnson and Wales in Charlotte, the culinary school, like right out of high school. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty, And so now it's like, I don't know. It's weird with culinary school. It's kind of like within the food world, it's a little bit frowned upon, I think, just in that there's a certain, I don't know, it's just, it's very expensive and like kind of unnecessary. And so I think, yeah, for me, it was just like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to do something within the realm of food. And that seemed like a good way to get out of Durham, um, like, like going to a different city and enrolling in school. When was the first time that you thought about food as more than just like, oh, I have to eat every day, you know, to have energy to do things. W was Were your parents involved in the culinary arts at all? Was there something else that triggered this interest in food? Where did that all start? Um, you know, it's funny, actually, because I think for me, it's almost like the opposite of that, if it makes sense. Like, I didn't realize until much later in life that there are people out there that like don't care about food at all, like that they just that they are eating for sustenance. I think for me growing up, um, like as a small kid and then through the rest of my life, like both of my parents were very involved with cooking um, and my grandparents also. Um, so yeah, I, I've always gravitated towards food. I can remember like watching Food Network with my dad growing up and just being like so entertained and uh, like if my parents would go out for a night, um, even at like 12 or 13, I'm like at home, like I'm baking the most basic things. But there's just something really cool about like seeing 
raw materials turn into something else, I guess, just like the progress of it has, is really cool to me. And then also just like the comfort and the nostalgia and just like the warmness of eating is like, it's just such a satisfying feeling. And, and now it's even developed into just like cooking for others and, and sharing that experience is like one of the greatest joys of my life, I think, really, truly. Yeah, there is something about cooking and being able to like cooking for yourself and then eating the food, there's a real satisfaction. Yeah, it's so like, gratifying. Put, you know, I put a certain amount of labor into this and now I get to reap the rewards. Uh, and like you said, when you can share with others, I, I think that that's, um, you know, I wasn't familiar with the idea of things like friends giving in high school, mm -hmm. but I know that's a thing that I see a lot more, a lot more folks doing now. Um, and and I, I love that idea of just like using leveraging food as an opportunity to get together and commune with others. Um, and that seems to span across cultures too, like lots of different places ac across the world use food yes, in that way. Definitely. I think that's like one of the coolest things about it too, is that it's like, it's just applies to everyone for the most part. Like most people, everyone needs to eat. Most people enjoy eating things that are good. And so it's just cool to be able to like share across like all different lifestyles and demographics that it's something that people enjoy. What is it about about Johnson and Wales that is looked frowned? Is it just because like you can learn to cook without the need for yeah, a teacher? Yeah, I think that's what it is, is like um, just that there's this, not like that it's looked down upon, but just that like if you instead just start as like a dishwasher or a prep cook and kind of like work your way up through a restaurant like you can save yourself so much money and like actually get paid to be learning things and I yeah I don't want to just like throw it under the bus like it was a terrible experience like I did I'm sure I learned a lot of like the fundamentals of cooking and it covers a lot of different things um but I think just because it is so expensive and then on the other side of things that like it's not entirely necessary. Um, I, I think that like people who cook professionally, there's a certain like nod of approval that they get if they didn't go and they just kind of like ran through all of the hoops um, to like get to where they are. Came up in the ranks. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it does seem like, I mean, I don't know a ton about the culinary arts, um, but you know, outside of the degrees or the, the professions that require degrees like medical school or being a lawyer, uh, people's minds are changing around the idea of needing mm -hmm. a degree for a particular um, occupation. And yeah, it would have been nice if we had all learned that lesson. Yeah, absolutely, a lot right? <laughs> I, I think about that a lot too, because I, I work part-time with a, a group based here in Durham called Code the Dream, and we do workforce development for folks interested in breaking into technology. And a lot of them are immigrants and mm -hmm. uh, refugees, people of color who don't have the uh, opportunities to go to four-year college. Mm -hmm, and so for mm -hmm. them to be able to get into an industry, uh, a good paying, getting a good paying job in an industry like technology can be difficult, but putting them through these, uh, these coding classes mm -hmm. and being able to help them with job placement, they're able to subvert that in some ways. And but yeah, that just wasn't a thing. Sure, for us. I think I think you're right though. It's like definitely something that is changing, or at least the idea of it is kind of starting to change. Because I feel like 10, 15 years ago, like when we were in high school, it was like you didn't really have another option. Like you had to continue education, and it's like, well, what if I had just taken a year off and worked, or like what if I, I don't know, did like some kind of specialized trade school rather than going into like a typical an associates or like for your bachelor degree is like there are so many options and I just was not even aware of any of them really. Yeah and I would say even community college I mean I ended up going to Durham Tech for a couple years not right after high school but uh, a few years after high school and even that I think Durham Tech was looked at almost as like the flunky school. <laughs> sure yeah I, and I know what you mean and it's too bad that it's not like more encouraged as like no, you can do this in like the meantime while you're figuring it out, but like still continuing to progress, but not like investing, you know, like a huge chunk of money into yeah. a four year degree. Was there something specific during your time at Johnson and Wales um, that you feel like you wouldn't have gotten if you hadn't gone to, uh, to um, school there? I guess so, but it's it's not really anything that like I would apply into the real world. Um, which I think kind of ties into like 
why it's so expensive. Like, especially the one in Charlotte, when I went there back in 2008, 2009, it was a brand new facility. So like all of the kitchen equipment was like brand new. Everything you're using was like really, really nice. And they have you teach or learn like all these different courses that some of it is just like I was saying, like very fundamental, like here's the basics to cooking. And some of it was like a garmage class where you learn how to carve ice with a chainsaw. I was like, wow, this is really cool, but like I'm probably never going to apply this to anything in my life. Um, so that's like, yeah, just a, a thing that it's like, this was a cool experience, but I'm not really going to use this later on. Yeah, it's like it, it opens you up to all these different types of opportunities, but maybe not specialized in a way that is more applicable to like an actual uh, career that most people, I mean, maybe somebody is making a career out of carving ice, but yeah, right. it seems to be <laughs> few and far between. Well, and then it's funny too, because once you get into the workforce, like post degree, I think especially like the generational difference with like our parents and us, like my mom was always like, oh, well, like you should be able to leverage like better pay because of your degree. And I'm like, they don't care. <laughs> like no one really cares As within the food industry. I think especially it's all about either networking or past experience is like really the thing that matters because um, anyone can pay the money and go to school and then slap on that they like have this two year degree. Um, but it takes a lot more to have come up from different restaurants or like worked different positions and that kind of thing, um, I think is is the way to go if you're trying to leverage better pay or better hours within restaurants. What were some of your favorite things to cook as a kid? Were were you what were some of the influences that you were pulling from? Were there particular types of meals that you enjoyed? Were you baking? Was it um, yeah I don't know. Were you were you working with meat a lot as a kid as well? Um, definitely working with meat pretty often. So my dad hunted a lot growing up. Well, w while I was growing up, um, and I, God, it kind of sounds gross, but like not even just hunting, but sometimes like there's so many deer in Durham. And like, if there was a deer that was recently hit on the side of the road and like it was still in pretty good shape, like sometimes we would take that one home as well. Like I have this, uh, like very specific memory ingrained in my head of being um, in Cotillion at like fifth or sixth grade and like driving back from like Hope Valley Country Club and I have like my little white gloves on and he's like, all right, we found a deer. Like, I'm going to need you to help me like load this onto the back of the trailer. I'm like, oh my God, this is so gross. But it's just too bad. Like I really, that was a big part of uh, just like what we would eat growing up just because like there was so much of it and you can make a lot of different things out of it. And it's kind of funny that my life has now uh, brought me to butchery because I, at the time, like as a, a young teen, wasn't really paying attention to what my dad was doing at home. And like now I'm really wishing that I had paid more attention or maybe spent more time with him like while he was processing everything at home. But like at the time was just kind of grossed out by stuff. Um, so it's just funny how things work out that this is now like a profession that I'm seeking out. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I didn't, uh, my dad growing up uh, cooked a lot for us and he, he's a vegan now and even back then didn't eat a ton of meat. So I never got that experience either mm -hmm. of like really digging into like having to, I don't know, like de feather a chicken or like all the things sure. I guess you would get, you know, if you lived on a farm. Uh, uh, but even, I guess, like you said, with the oversized deer population yes. here, it seems like that's a common thing for folks in this area to have is venison, right? Yes. Deer, yeah. Uh, to have that as part of their diet. Is is it particularly, um, how would it compare to like other meat that more people would be familiar um, with? Um, I would say like definitely similar to beef, but a lot leaner. So like with sausage making, um, you really need like a pretty fatty ratio, fat to lean. Um, so like, if you ever make a venison sausage, like a lot of times people will supplement pork fat into it. Um, but it, yeah, it's got a similar uh, like texture to beef, but a little bit gamier. And then yeah, just very, very lean. Were you working at any of the, not that there were nearly as many as there are now, but were you working at any of the local restaurants in Durham um, uh, in high school? Yeah. So my dad, after my parents got divorced, my dad, you know, like being a bachelor was like out on the scene. And so he would spend a lot of time um, over at Parizade. 
uh, which is, they're still open, right? Yeah, they're, I, they're the ones over off of Irwin yes. Road. Yeah. yeah, they're in that little Irwin Square yeah. area. Um, so, like, that was kind of going on uh, when I was becoming of age to work and was already sort of thinking that food would be a good path or at least, like, a way to make some money while I was still in school. Um, so I picked up some shifts there, um, like, before graduating, I worked um, the pastry station there for a little while. And then other than that, I mean, after that, I went to college. And then when I moved back, like before moving out west, I worked um, for Chirba Chirba for a while. Oh, yeah, the food truck. Mm -hmm, Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, it, it seems like now if you were to get into the culinary arts in Durham, you'd have any number of restaurants to choose from, styles of food to choose yes. from. Uh, and so that's, I hadn't really thought about like what the, that kind of growth in Durham in terms of our food scene, what it would mean for like young up and coming um, folks that want to work in, in the business. I always just thought it was like, oh, we have more places to eat, but that, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. there, there are <laughs> lots more opportunities for folks to actually learn. And I mean, we have, what is it? James Beard, award-winning restaurants yeah, here in the Triangle. Sure. So it's, you know, there are folks who really know what they're doing. And um, since you've been back, has there been a particular place that you've really enjoyed going um, to? I would say probably M. Coco. It's so good. Like, I had heard things, and I still need to try the other M restaurants, but, like, I've been a couple times now, and I've been pretty blown away uh, both times. Um like I was about to say something oh okay so that's what I was gonna say it's just that we moved in 2015 first to Oakland and as as soon as I started learning more about butchery and and all of the things that go along with it I kind of started having this idea in my head of like wow it would be really cool to move home and open like a shop of my own at some point down the road and then from there we moved to Denver and then to Portland and I was really enjoying a lot of these places that I was living and especially with Portland like my friend there is like please don't move like why don't you just start your business here and I don't know it just always seemed like Durham was a very good market for it when I would tell people like who aren't from North Carolina or are not familiar with the area like oh, I'm moving back home to start this business. And they'd be like, well, why would you do that? And I'm like, well, Durham is always on like every like top 10 food cities that you didn't know about and just like things like that. I'm like, I I really think I have a good shot here um, because it's already a place that people really care about what they're eating. Um, And just like networking wise, I, I know more people there because that's where I'm from. So that was definitely a big pull to come back to Durham. Cool. Uh, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. So we started to head this direction in a little bit uh, before we went to break, talking about different businesses in downtown Durham, places you've worked, um, other places that you enjoy going. Uh, but why we're here is to hear more about your business. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd love for you to talk about how it came together. You s- mentioned that you were interested in starting your own uh, food operation for some time now, but what was it that finally tipped you over into actually putting the business plan together coming up with the you know the name and the logo just like all that stuff that um people often like don't even think about when they're starting a business uh but but have to get done to to get the thing rolling um so if you could yeah share a little bit more about that sure um so i hope this doesn't sound bad but i think a big part of it was just Working in the food industry, I think for anyone who's done it, knows that in some ways it's a lot of work for maybe at least monetarily, not like a huge reward. Like you really have to enjoy what you're doing, and and I do. Um, But just finding that like working for different people over the years and as I was getting older, it kind of got to a point where it was like this is very labor-intensive work, and while I am enjoying it, I just feel like if I'm really going to stick with this as like a career path, then I want to be owning my own business. Um, So that was always something I had kind of thought about. And then 
Also along those lines, just that um, like working in restaurant kitchens, like on the line, it can be really, really fun if everything's going well, even when you're super weeded. It's just like there's you're like on a high when things are going well and everything's like running out and like going the way that it should it's great but when it's not great it's like the exact opposite and like extremely stressful everyone's yelling at you and you're like really sweaty and it's just a lot so, so it is exactly like what Gordon Ramsay makes it look like yeah. on TV is what you're saying yeah. um so I think even before I moved away from Durham I was at least interested in like how can I stay within the food industry because this is something that I'm passionate about but maybe not be like a line cook or a sous chef or something that's going to be like restaurant hours and and just that atmosphere. Um, what was so the hardest part about that? Like what are the, you don't have to tell any war stories if you don't want, but was there, you know, working, I guess, back of house, you would mm-hmm. call it, um, what you mentioned the being on a high when things are good and it being a disaster when things are bad, but there is there a particular part of that experience that like really weighs on you to the point where you're like, yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta get um, out of this. I think just like the stress of it. And then that it's also very physically exhausting that like, if you're going through all of that work and you're not having a good time, that it's like, this is maybe not for me. Um, and the late and hours too. Yeah. There's just a lot that. of factors like the hours for sure, because it, it changes like what you're able to do um, like socially and just like in life. If, if I don't know, with like most Monday through Friday jobs, you have a very set schedule. You can plan things ahead of time. But a lot of times with kitchen work, it's like the sous chef is making the schedule like week by week. So if you're like, Oh, am I going to be free that like Sunday, four weeks from now? Like I have actually no idea. Um, like scheduling was always really stressful to me and yeah, just, just the hours and like, um, yeah, that it's, it's very hard work and, um, it's not a great feeling when things are not going well because people get mad and then you just sort of take it out on yourself. Um, so yeah, I think before I even moved, just the idea of like, how can I stay within this food industry, but sort of pivot what I'm doing. And also the, just that I had always sort of had a, an interest in meat because it's something that I've enjoyed eating. Um, that was sort of like, wow, if I could find, like, any kind of job within butchery, that would be really, really cool. Um, And then after moving to the Bay Area, like, the first um, place that I went and staged at, which is, like, an an interview, essentially, um, was this restaurant Clovenhoof in Oakland. Um, And they're essentially, like, a sandwich shop, but also a whole animal butchery, um, and they're conjoined. Um, And, like, a lot of the things that are being processed and made in the butchery side of things are then used for sandwiches um so I got a job there just working on the line which was a lot of fun too like I learned a lot I worked with some really amazing people um were you working on both sides of the business um so I I just started like with the sandwich side of things and um I mean and it was really cool too I think you always hear like growing up on the east coast they're like oh California is like ahead of the like just in general, like ahead of all the trends and especially with food, like I just don't think I really knew what I was getting myself into. But as soon as I got there, it was like every like cook that I met and just people that I was working with, it was like, like, wow, I've never thought to do that. Or just like all these crazy things, like learning constantly and feeling like you're just a sponge, like trying to absorb everything. And I going into that job knew like, hey, maybe this could be, they even put it in the ad, like, potential butcher shifts like if you're interested um which at the time too like I had no knowledge of anything and I think that's what's so interesting about butchery is like I I feel even kind of weird after like the six or seven years that I've been doing this like calling myself a butcher because I'm very familiar with pork butchery and like could totally do like a full lamb and chicken obviously as well but with beef like steers are so large that even though every animal is the same, like you're going to have all of the same muscles because beef is so large. There's like the muscles are humongous. So like seaming all of those out, you just have many more options for different cuts of meat, if that makes sense. Like something that like a whole pork shoulder, you may keep whole and like bone out and make into a roast or just take like one part of that and use it for something else. But with beef, like that piece of chuck is massive and there's like many different steaks just within that one primal or subprimal 
um, I guess back to the job, it was like, oh, um, you know, if you ever want to like learn anything, you, you're welcome to come in on a day off. Um, so I did that for about mm, six months, probably every day off or so, like once a week, I would go over and hang out in the butcher shop for a few hours. And they would like, show me how to break pigs down or show me how to make sausage, just like little things like that, like learning how to bone out um, certain things. There's just a big learning curve there. Because I think um, probably a lot of people who work in the food industry feel the same way. At least this is how it was for me. Like, at the time when I started that job, I had been working in restaurants for almost 10 years, but just had very little knowledge about like a ribeye, for example, is like maybe the most popular cut of beef. And like if you had asked me then like f point out like where this is on the cow, I honestly would have no idea. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's just a common sentiment that like while a lot of people are familiar with cooking meat, they just don't know that much about it. Um, so all of that was brand new to me. And I'm so, so grateful that the folks over there were like so eager to teach because sometimes I think – this industry can get like a little bit gatekeepy just about like well no this is how we do things just I think more old school butchers it's like you know they're reluctant to teach people things and I really lucked out um into a team that was like super knowledgeable but also like very eager and open to sharing their wealth of knowledge so it worked out great for me is your experience there uh you started describing the not necessarily difficulties, but the maybe over, like how beef can be overwhelming compared to other types of meat. Is that one of the things that steered you away from doing beef uh, now with Moonbelly? Um, I, I guess that's definitely part of it. Um, and then also just that, um, like for the kinds of things that I wanted to make, at least within sausage and most charcuterie projects, like they're all kind of for focused around pork. And yeah, that's definitely like where I feel most familiar. It's kind of interesting because I would say that there's almost like a certain amount of catharsis with it. Like if you are breaking a pig down, obviously each animal is a little bit different and you might run into something that like is a surprise. But for the most part, it's like everything is the same. So once you get down the basics of it, it's like you kind of know what to expect. And I don't know, it, it sounds like psychotic, maybe a little bit that that's like an enjoyable thing for me. But I actually do like, really love the process of like, breaking everything down and boning things out and like skinning, taking the skin off. You're basically <laughs> Dexter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> was there, because um, at, uh, you said Cloven Hoof? Mm -hmm. Is that the name? Yeah, correct. Place? And was there, uh, you know, leading up to that, you'd worked some in the industry. Uh, was there a particular thing that you gleaned from that experience uh, that was either something you didn't know already um, and, like, was it that experience working with them that pushed you into thinking about business ownership? Or was there, were there many things uh, in between that? Um, I think that that was probably like the start of the push, if that makes sense. Just in that I knew, um, like I said, just kind of going into it, it was like, oh, well, it'd be great to like learn enough that this is something that I could like turn into a career. Um, but just with how welcoming everybody was and like the people that I got to work with there too, like I don't mean it to sound like pretentious at all, but like they were pros for sure. Um, so to be able to have that be like my first experience and like really, really learn a lot of stuff. It was like overwhelming at times, um, especially in the beginning, because it was just like taking on so much that I had no idea about. Um, yeah, I don't know. That just really was inspiring to me. And then like, kind of gave me that idea of like, well, this is a great resource. These people are awesome. Like, I still am in touch with a few of the folks there. And like, we'll shoot them like literally this week, I had a question about like, how long should I cook this thing for? And like, at what temperature and just texted my old boss. And he was like, so happy to help so that's was yeah I can't like stress enough just like how grateful I am that I had that experience um and like at the time that I did too I think restaurants it seems are kind of constantly shifting as far as staffing goes a lot of times like I I know with 
like office jobs, you know, if you're at a job for five years, that might not really seem like that much. But within the food community, I think like even three years staying in one restaurant, especially in the Bay Area where it is so competitive and like there's so much going on that a lot of times people will just work somewhere for like six months, learn and then peace out. Um, so to really be able to spend a good amount of time there and um yeah, just learn and then continue to get comfortable with that situation um, was a great experience. And also, like, that was, um, aside from working on the Cherba truck, it was really my first experience with doing any kind of front of house work where just that you're interacting, you know, you're working a butcher shop, the counter, so you're having to, like, try and sell stuff to people. And um, I think I kind of touched on it earlier, but just that it is such a foreign thing, like even to people who work in food, but then as a consumer too, like I think that oftentimes people get very intimidated because beyond like a pork tenderloin or a pork chop, it's like, I don't know what any of this is. And um, yeah, I don't know, just like trying to learn to, um, I don't mean it in a mean way either, not to be patient with people, but just to try to explain things in a way that is like, really makes sense was a challenge for me. Um, I think that makes total sense the, that most people, I mean, I know for me, I like eating a lot of different foods, but I, I couldn't tell you a ton about them, meat or not. Uh, and so I, I think that there is a, hopefully there is a curiosity there from the consumer um, and they're willing to come and ask questions. And then to your point, you probably do have to be somewhat patient because as you get involved in the business and become more knowledgeable it, it's so secondhand that you forget like oh yeah these people don't have the you know depth of knowledge that i have about these different pieces of meat and how they work and what to put them in like how to cook them all that kind of stuff so um yeah you're both a um you know you're, you're a butcher but you're also a, a teacher in a lot of ways in mm -hmm. that moment well and it was just so funny too because especially in the beginning it would be like so I don't know, someone would come up and be like, oh, top sirloin, like, how do I cook this? And I'm like, uh, I got to run to the bathroom really quick. And then I just like Google on my phone, like, what do I do? But uh, yeah, it's just funny. Like there are certain things, uh, I think, especially like that with butchery, there's not a wide knowledge with where even like the internet sometimes is not a great resource. Like you really need to either have like, um, there's a few books that are really helpful. And yeah, just knowing people who already know know the stuff is has been immensely helpful i think that that's always the fallback for me before i start thinking about google or even books is like do i know somebody that's doing this right yeah, now and has or, the experience like yeah. real life experience with this because you can with that too i find that you can cater it more to your own experience sometimes you read about a, a subject and you're like okay i, I get the the basics but like i have a very specific need yeah you or, can't ask a follow-up question right <laughs> uh so having those mentors that are able to share that knowledge with you and get into the nuances um can really speed things along and 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 you know it builds a, a good community around the art form as well whatever it is and that is really how um it sounds like your experience uh, in san francisco like that that is still very meaningful to you as you're thinking about building your own business and being able to text them with questions. Yeah, for sure, for sure. When, when you started um, Moonbelly, were you thinking that it would be in Durham? Or had you already moved back here um, before generating the business idea? Or were you already thinking about it before you came um, back I'm Definitely Durham? thinking about it before. Like, I would say even at the point of, like, leaving Oakland. So we did, uh, I lived in Oakland for about three years and then my partner Hart got a job in Denver. So we moved to Denver for like a year. He was there a little bit longer cause he moved ahead of me. Um, and then we were just in Portland for the last two years. Um, but I would say like maybe in between the move from Oakland to Denver and then also like no shade to Denver, but it just like wasn't a great fit for me. And so being there, it was kind of like, well, do we go from here, move back to Durham, or should I continue to just try and, like, gain more experience and uh, maybe, like, move somewhere else on this side of the country? Um, but, yeah, it, it became pretty apparent to me, like, once I felt confident enough that, like, I'm gaining enough experience that this is something that I could do on my own, I always had Durham as, like, the location that I wanted to do it in. Um, 
because of, like I said, like just that the food scene is um, so robust and then also like the friends and family networking and connections there. It just seemed like it made the most sense. And also, like it's funny to say now, but um, the affordability of, of cost of living seemed like, okay, well, maybe that's the ticket is to move back to Durham. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, while things are rapidly changing here all the time, it is still more affordable than a lot of the major cities across the country. So I guess, you know, we can't take that for granted mm -hmm. too much, although, yeah. you know, who knows how long that will, <laughs> yeah, that will actually last. Uh, what's been the most uh, enjoyable thing about starting your own business? Because there are so many things that go into it and obviously can be really stressful uh, because you are on your own and there are all these boxes you have to check. Uh, but there are these little moments I've found that really make it feel worthwhile. And I'm wondering if there are some of those for you and if you would share. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say just right off the bat, probably like the freedom of it. Um, I knew right away with um, just like how I wanted my business to present itself as far as like branding and that kind of thing goes that um, it just seems like with a lot of these smaller butcher shops, and I, I don't mean it in an offensive way at all, but just that they're often a very specific type of like black and white with like a cleaver as the logo, and it's just very rigid. Um, and I knew, especially being both um, like racially and um, gender wise a minority within this industry that I just wanted to go like the exact opposite direction. So I always had a really clear vision of like wanting to choose name wise, like something that sounded really fun. And can you talk a little bit more about the name? Yeah, of course. So um, the, the name is Moonbelly Meat Company. Um, I mentioned before that I am adopted from South Korea. Um, and I always just have thought this is so cool, but after I was adopted, uh, my parents kept my Korean surname, which is Moon, in like my legal name. So like my full name is Anna Marie Moon Gabala. Um, so I just like throughout my entire life have always had like an affinity for moons. Like I, I have several moon tattoos. I like usually have earrings or something. I've always gravitated just towards that because it seems like one way that can kind of tie me to my roots um, in a way that nothing else really can. Um, and then belly being something that, especially with pork, is like a very prized cut. You can make pancetta or bacon or just eat it as like a braised or roasted pork belly is delicious. Um, and I think maybe it was um, my partner Hart who first kind of put the two words together and we were like wow that like I think he said it to like my dog or something oh like you little moon belly and I just thought that that sounded really cute and had like a kind of fun ring to it um and we kind of workshopped like a few other things but I just kept coming back to that um and actually had someone over the summer point out to me like oh my daughter's a doula and like that's actually like a pregnancy term which I tried huh. to sort of like survey people after I had committed to being like, this is what I'm going with. And no one else had heard of that. So um, I stuck with it. And now I'm really happy that I did because I, I just think it's cute and it gives maybe a little bit more personality to things. Um, and yeah, I just think it's fun. So I love that. I, I It's really, I, I think, because of the same thing for me, Buddy Ruski was a nickname that my dad used for me a lot. Uh, when I was a kid. And so as I was thinking about branding uh, as an adult, uh, both even before I started doing the this podcasting business, like when I got online, mm -hmm. basically, like when it was time to come up with Twitter handles and all that kind of sure. stuff, I was like, well, I, I kind of like that Buddy Ruski thing. And to your point, it, it roots you in a sense of uh, place and family and and it's a nice story. I mean, I really enjoyed hearing you tell your story. Like I, there, there's something there. It's not just a word, but there's a lot of um, history behind it and meaning. And so I, I find that those types of uh, brand stories really mm -hmm. resonate with folks. Um, and to your point too, to differentiate from the other types of businesses that are in the industry, you very much made it your own. And I, I think it really fits the your personality and just like the thing that you're bringing to the industry so that's really cool yeah awesome thank you so much yeah I mean I even aside from the name I just knew like right from the start like 
I really want this to be as welcoming as possible because kind of like what I was saying before, I just feel like there's a certain amount of like condescension sometimes because this whole industry is so foreign to people as a consumer where you can go into a place and like immediately feel very intimidated or like just feel silly for asking certain questions and like I just my whole goal with this entire business is to just do like the opposite of that and try and make it as inclusive as a space as possible and just like fun and um, the graphic designer that helped me with my branding is actually Hart's brother. Um, so it was nice because he made things very communicative, but very from the very beginning, I was like, I just want to use like fun, like retro font, like a lot of bright colors and just make it like really, really cute. And yeah, just the opposite of what most people are doing right now with this industry. Yeah. What is your process like uh, day to day? You mentioned that you're sharing kitchen space right now mm -hmm. um you do some delivery as well yes um, of the meat so what is that like from sort of start to finish how would folks engage with your business sure so rather than just like jumping straight into trying to secure a storefront i thought that maybe the better option would be um just renting commissary space which i was kind of familiar with um just having worked on a food truck before because Cherba um, also rented commissary space. And then actually the last job that I had in Portland, um, just based on like their business model, a lot of the production, which is what I was doing, happened offsite at a different commissary um, facility. Um, so I knew like maybe that was the way to go about things is just sort of test the waters, maybe like try and get into the farmer's market or find some way to sell things that wasn't diving straight into like, paying and signing a lease on a building in case things don't go well. Um, but yeah, right now I'm over at the Red Start Food Commissary and they like, Matt, the owner has been so, so, so helpful and just really, really nice about everything. Um, so I'm extremely grateful to be there. Um, but right now I usually um, will try to like update my website every Sunday, just um, like the online store of like, here's what I'm gonna have this week. Um, and then on Mondays, usually I'll go in and sort of have like a prep list in mind of the stuff that I'm going to be making throughout the week and go ahead and like mise out all of my little spice kits that I'm going to need and measure everything out. Um, Tuesdays are when um, First Hand receives their orders. So I either will have mine delivered or go pick up like whatever pork I'm going to be using. Um, and at the moment, I would love to eventually switch to doing like only whole animal um but right now i'm just like not quite moving enough so what i've been doing is ordering like maybe a shoulder or two one week and then half of a hog the next week and sort of alternating back and forth um so yeah tuesday i get the pork i do most of the butchering and like deboning everything and just sort of like um assigning like this trim is going to this project or like i'm gonna make hams out of this um and then Wednesday is like my big production day and kind of dribbles into Thursday, depending on how much I get done on Wednesday. Uh, try to package everything on Thursday and then I deliver it all on Friday. Um, and then for anyone that doesn't want their stuff delivered, um, they're able to pick it up the following like Monday and Tuesday over at the commissary. So I'm still kind of working the kinks out, but that's what I'm working with right now. So. That's super cool. Yeah, I, I think it, you're right that it was smart to get your feet wet, figuring out um, the process. And I, I, that's that's always been the uh, sort of Durham model, I think, for a lot of restaurants here. I, I remember, I guess in like 2014, 15, um, Pie Pushers was a food truck. And then I... I will not take credit for them getting brick and mortar, but I did advocate a lot on Twitter mm -hmm. for them to eventually get a brick and mortar um, just because I, I enjoyed their pizza so much. It's and so good. I'm so happy to see that like that's a thriving business too because I feel like when I moved away, I don't know that they had the brick and mortar yet, but I was definitely familiar with them just working all the different food truck rodeos. And we actually both, at least when I started with Cherba, were using the cookery as our commissary space. So we would kind of run into each other every now and then. Um, and yeah, their food is so good. So yeah, I'm just like ha so happy for them. Yeah, and th there are a bunch of other spots too. Um, Bariqua Sol, uh, I've worked there uh, on and off for a few years. They were a food truck. I guess they still have the truck, but um, have a brick and mortar mm -hmm. space now. Um, so that model seems to work. And 
it also reminds me like how invested Durham gets in its restaurants or just in its businesses in general, like to see people make that climb from, you know, small food truck or sort of independent business into brick and mortar into like having, you know, storefronts and employees, like all that kind of stuff uh, is, is really cool. And, and I hope that that continues to be a sustainable model for folks that it doesn't get so uh, expensive here that people can't sort of graduate Um, Mm -hmm. through those different levels of business. What has been your favorite thing that you've been uh, cooking or like putting together since you started Moon Valley? Hmm. Um, Okay, this is going to sound silly, but I think actually um, hot dogs. (laughs) Like I I would guess that most people don't know that it's actually fairly technical um, because any type of uh, product like that, like a hot dog or bologna or mortadella, something that's very smooth like that, texturally, like if you think about when you cut one in half, it's like one cohesive piece rather than a sausage where it looks like ground meat. Um, It's because it's emulsified in that you're bringing, you start with like fat and lean as two separate things and you're like emulsifying them together um so it's actually quite difficult to do not to toot my own horn but like I think it's it's been an obstacle throughout the years at the different places that I've worked it's always been something that's been a little bit stressful um to try and complete correctly um and it even this go around like I thought the first time I did it I was like oh whatever like I have so much experience doing this it's gonna be easy And the first batch I was not super pleased with. Um, But just in the last two weeks, I've kind of tweaked some methods and uh, just certain things that I'm doing. And this most recent batch that I came out with, I was just like beaming because I was so happy with how they came out. Is there a certain way that you, um, you know, once the hot dog is made, I've seen a couple photos on your Instagram. It looks like it's more elaborate than just like your ballpark frank you know you're not mm-hmm. just like throwing ketchup on it and serving it they they look like um i don't i mean i don't know they look like very <laughs> um interesting presentations yeah for i don't know flavor wise i think i am trying to just like s- at, at least for the hot dog itself like trying to keep it as uh, basic as possible. Like I, uh, Matt, the owner of Red Start, he has, I think she's maybe like a year and a half, a small child. Mm, she might be two. I should I should probably know that. Um, but she came in the other day when I happened to be like cooking off a test batch and they took a couple home and he was like, oh yeah, like Romy loved it. It was awesome. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to hear. Like as far as just like a This is just so silly because they're hot dogs. But as far as just like a basic hot dog goes, it'd be great if like the flavor matches up with what people want to expect out of a hot dog. But to know that like it's all coming from like local sustainable farms because that's definitely not going to be the case with like an Oscar Mayer Frank. So I am definitely trying to like stick with flavors that people are familiar with but maybe elevate them to some extent and then – uh, yeah, definitely, like, toppings uh, make things really fun, and th- and there's just, like, so many options, too, when you're starting from a pretty neutral base of just a hot dog. <laughs> yeah, are you experimenting at all with, like, I mean, obviously, people have an idea of what a hot dog is and the way it should be prepared, or I guess the way that it's traditionally prepared, mm-hmm. but are you, as you're putting together not just the hot dogs, but just the um, the pork that you're working with in general, like, what's that experimentation process like? Are you uh, bringing in other types of spices that people don't normally combine with pork? Or are there different toppings that you might be using on a hot dog that people aren't expecting? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, kind of to get back to your previous question, too, about um, just, like, what's been the most fun about um, starting a business is um, it all sort of goes back to Clovenhoof. Like, the whole thing there was that I did have a certain amount of freedom. Like there was always staple flavors that I had to make every single week for the case, but they usually would let me just sort of, for one of them, like think of whatever I wanted to do and just do that. Um, And that's been a really, really fun part of this is that now that I'm the owner of the business, I can kind of, as within a certain amount of means, like if it's, you want it obviously to be something that other people are going to enjoy, but Uh, that was definitely a big part of the business model too is like let how can I make this like really fun and just 
not in like a gross way, but also kind of a gross way. Like what's like just like stoner, like crazy, weird combinations that like you wouldn't see typically just at like a farmer's market or in the Whole Foods butcher case. Um, like I'm trying to think of some of the more fun ones that I've done. Um, I once made like a uh, chicken sausage that I modeled after uh, – the barbecue chicken pizza at California Pizza Kitchen. Um, And I think that one came out really well. Like it had like that barbecue flavor, but then also like cilantro and a little bit of pork to like be the bacon part of it or just other like fun ideas like that. Um, I've done like an anchovy pizza sausage that I think maybe not everyone loves anchovies. I really do. But yeah, just trying to make it uh, a more unique and like really really fun very full of flavor flavors that's really cool uh yeah i'm not a big fan of anchovies but <laughs> yeah. honestly like i would be worth uh it would be worth trying it just to yeah see yeah, what so kind good. of things they're you're just putting like together. salty and briny and yeah i'm into it do you have a favorite food that you like to work with um outside of pork um i would say probably eggs i know that's like kind of a weird one but i just think they're like so fun to cook because you can cook them so many different ways and like as simple as it is uh I think if you're really trying to get like the perfect egg there's actually a little bit of like you have to be really delicate I always like heart will sometimes hear me screaming from the kitchen because I'm like making eggs in the morning and if I break the yolk like while it's coming out of the shell I like scream because I'm like no that's like the one thing I was looking forward to is like having the perfect runny yolk um so, yeah, I think just that you can, like, boil them, like, soft boil them, make egg salad. I don't know. That's also starting to sound silly, but just that there's, like, so many options and different ways to cook them and that it can get kind of technical. I think it's just really fun and delicious, too. Yeah, I think eggs – I mean, I, I learned to cook eggs from a pretty early age, and I feel like they're a good, like, starter food. Yeah, absolutely. If you're trying to learn how to cook. yes. Yeah, because they can be very basic, and then you can also, like, get kind of weird with it and make it, like, a whole different experience. So, yeah, that's always been really fun to me. Yeah, they they blend well with other things. Like, you can make, um, I mean, I guess folks put eggs in, you know, ramen dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make breakfast burritos with eggs. You can do all kinds of different things. Um, So, yeah, it is another food that's, like, really, um, it sounds, like, similar to pork that you can... um, like mix and match and, mm-hmm. and sort of use it as this base to combine with a lot of different things, which is really neat. Um, cool. Well, yeah, I, I have really enjoyed hearing about uh, all the things that you've learned over the years uh, in, in your experience in the culinary arts and how that's culminated in this business that you've uh, thankfully for all of us brought back to <laughs> Durham. Uh, I, I've noticed that more and more that people um, – who you know we grew up with, or who are from this area, are finding their way back here. Um, you know, Durham is calling out to them. Yes, so for sure. It's really cool to see that, and um, you know, all these different gifts that people have uh, accumulated in these different parts of the country or the world um, are now making their way back to Durham and are, are adding to this um, really yeah special places. I, I I find that like as much as I um, am you know, talk shit on Twitter about <laughs> things that are happening here or the way it's changing mm-hmm. or, you know, all that stuff. I, I still like really enjoy being here and yes. enjoy seeing other people appreciate what's going on here. So, um, yeah, maybe to close, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but just, um, what do you look forward to, uh, now being back in Durham, both just sort of as an individual, but also as a business owner? Um, I think th- The biggest thing is just um, as much as we've moved around these last few years, I always was trying to keep in mind, like, really focusing on getting more experience and, like, trying to learn all these different techniques from all the, like, the, I worked at three different places in Denver that were all very different and, like, really tried to absorb as much information there and then also with the job that I had in Portland and, and, of course, in Oakland as well, but Uh, Just very much like I had always been really looking forward to like, wow, that's like a cool thing I didn't think about before. And like, I don't think anyone in Durham is really doing that yet. Um, So, yeah, just like trying to share all of these experiences that I've had and 
and try to supply like really delicious things to people is like very much something that I'm looking forward to doing and I hope that people are open to supporting my business. One thing that I am a little bit um, not upset about but just reluctant towards is that I know that what I'm selling is is pretty expensive um, and I just would love for people to have an understanding of like what's behind that just that um, I think there is a little bit of a disconnect there where when people are so used to only buying like commercially processed and industrialized meat that you're getting a very different product and so of course it's going to be much less expensive but the quality like uh, not to be like on a soapbox about things either but I just think this is your that platform <laughs> you should yeah speak your mind because um, I, I, I agree just when it comes to, I don't know like like I was saying about like trying to make this as inclusive as possible I think trying to show people that like you can still eat meat and be at least consciously ethical about what you're doing. And maybe that means like not eating meat with every single meal, but spending the money and the time and putting in the research to doing something that is hopefully a little bit more sustainable or that um, is just a better product and like really um, prioritizing that over like this is cheaper and so I'm gonna spend money on that. Um, is, is a big obstacle with this business, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And I also agree that I think particularly um, with meat and just like, yeah, we all can be more um, socially aware of where we're spending our money, how we're spending our money, also like our health, you mm -hmm. know, um, those, to your point, like the big commercialized meat, the things that they put into the animals, um, you know, they make their way into our bodies. And so... We yes. Have to yeah, be it's so essential kind of too that like it's just funny that you don't I mean me included that you're not always thinking about it as like it's literally going directly into my body so like why would I not pay more attention to that and so yeah I think just trying to really educate people that like this isn't factory farming like these are animals that are all raised within North Carolina specifically like in eastern North Carolina with the pork I know like it's all pasture raised like they're just out as far as I know, like from the research that I've been doing and like through firsthand that these animals are like free to roam and range. And um, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. Like the quality is so much better. You can just, it's like visible in a, in a raw cut of just like a pork chop that it's like, wow, that like looks better. Um, so yeah, I think everyone always is like, oh, you must eat so much meat. And I mean, aside from like the stuff that I'm making that I have to try, like I really, uh, I would say actually the more that I've learned about the meat industry and the longer that I've been doing this, I actually eat less meat than I used to. Um, I'm eating like more of a variety of things and like trying to utilize different cuts that maybe I wasn't before now that I'm aware of them. Um, and that's like really a big key behind trying to keep things sustainable too is like not just going straight for the filet or the ribeye and like, oh, what's this hanger steak? Like that sounds interesting or just to like, just trying to learn more about, there's just so much to know, so. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and I hope folks will um, consider that and continue to support your business and um, yeah, understand that, you know, you get what you pay for. And even if the price tag is slightly higher, you know, in the in the long run, it will be more than worth it. So um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for, for being on the show. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to catch up because we, we honestly haven't even really seen each other, I guess, since you moved out west. Yeah, um, or I mean, sometimes we would like run into each other like when I was home for stuff, but COVID kind of like, I just didn't come home for like two years. Yeah. So uh, that was... Yeah. Yeah. This has been great. Thank you so, so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Where can people find you uh, online? And then also it sounds like you're at the farmer's market some. Where, where can people engage with your business? Um, so I'm actually not at the farmer's market yet, um, but um, probably most active on Instagram. Um, so the Instagram handle is just at Moonbelly Meat Co. And then the website where you can do all of the ordering or just check in. I try to update it like pretty frequently um, if there's any new announcements or obviously like restocking the store um, is just moonbellymeatco.com. So. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, everyone definitely go 
uh, support Anna's business, check it out, learn more about um, the process. You, you got to hear a lot about it today on the show. But um, yeah, I think that uh, supporting local and, and thinking about how we can support our, our own community business owners is really important to a thriving Durham. So definitely do that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be back uh, at the microphone. This has been the Buddy Ruski Show. Uh, excited to have more of these uh, coming up for you. You can always find me at Buddy Ruski basically everywhere. Uh, website, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, I guess, as well. I'm, I don't really do much on the LinkedIn page for Buddy Ruski. But um, yeah, thank you all for listening. Uh, and we look forward to uh, talking to you next time. Take care.